Hey, business building warrior, welcome to Silent Sales Machine Radio, a short episode today. We like to do these midweek episodes, get in, get out, plant some thoughts in your brain, maybe give you a few tips, strategies, and send you on your way without much delay. So let's jump right into it. I want to think about with you and brainstorm with you on this episode a little bit in regards to building the perfect business model in your mind. That's what I did over 20 years ago. I sat down without thinking about the different business opportunities that were out there. I didn't address in my mind, hey, consider option A, B, or C. I just sat down and and imagined a dream scenario with the dream job income that I wanted to build for my family. And not so much the work that I'd be doing, but the income it would provide what my schedule and routine would look like, what would be required of me ultimately once I was successful. Of course, having the full knowledge that it would take plenty of work and there'd be a learning curve and there'd be some mistakes. I took all that into account. But once I got over that initial period of intense focused effort, we can call it, what would reality look like? And I would encourage you, you may even pause this episode right now, less than two minutes in, and just write these things down. I'll give you a few hints as to what was on my list, and maybe it will help you as you write your list. So on my list was, I wanted to be able to work from home. I wanted to be able to pick my business up and put it down whenever I needed to, meaning I didn't have to be at a certain place at a certain time every single week at the same time or every single day at the certain times. Complete flexibility. I wanted to be able to work fewer than full-time hours at whatever it was while making at least as much money as I could competitively against any kind of reasonable corporate career. At the time, I was earning approximately six figures working as a sales rep. So I wanted something that was pretty close to that pretty fast and then something that exceeded that in the near future. So that was on my list as well. I had things on there for me personally, like if it was a nice day, if it was sunny, if the weather was good and my wife and kids had other plans that they had in mind, hey, it's a beautiful day, dad, let's go to the zoo is the example. I wanted to be able to do that. I wanted it to be something that my family could step into when they wanted to and step out of if they had other opportunities that were better for them. Same thing with friends and family. Step in, work with flexibility, step out if it's no longer meeting the needs or you've got something else that you'd rather be doing. I put all those things on my list. Uh, A couple of the things that were involved, I wanted to have my business in my pocket. I wanted to be able to take the internet with me and go anywhere in the world, continue working my business without skipping a beat. If my family moved, if we went on an extended lengthy trip of some sort, I could check in, keep my business managed that way. I wanted it to be something that involved a community of other people who were doing the same thing or generally the same thing I was. So I had a group of people that I could associate with, ethical people who were serving a very valuable business need in the marketplace. And notice I haven't identified any specific business yet on my list. I'm just talking about the things I wanted my business to do for me. If it existed, if this opportunity existed anywhere, I wanted to find it. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to start off with what my skills are and what I feel like I can offer the world. I wanted to start off with what business opportunities are out there that meets the way I would like to be conducting my life so that I can volunteer, I could travel, I could spend time doing the things that I enjoyed and that I loved and that the financial prospects were there sufficient enough to be able to do these things without compromise. Does that make sense? So make your list. Maybe there's other things on your list. Maybe you could paint more specifics. And for me, it really wasn't about, it never has been, and I don't say this to sound virtuous, but stuff just doesn't do it for me. Having a slightly better car or a slightly bigger house or you know, slightly better whatever, it's of little importance to me. And as I've gotten older, it's become even less and less important. I'm just, I'm not a gift guy. I don't associate a lot of emotional attachment or reward with stuff. 
maybe you do. So maybe you put some things like that on there that you'd like to do. But ultimately, that's just how much money do you want to make, right? So you can afford those things. Interestingly enough, on that topic, I saw a survey one time where they asked a bunch of people, how much money do you currently make? And they also asked them, what do you consider to be comfortable income-wise? And the vast majority of people, when answering those two questions, there was a simple equation that that emerged from the two numbers. Do you want to guess what it is? Another time you might want to pause and just kind of guess what pattern emerged when you ask people, how much money do you earn right now? And at what income level would you consider yourself to be comfortable? Interestingly enough, the vast majority of respondents answered somewhere approximating twice their current income level. Isn't that interesting? So regardless of what your income level is now, you would really feel like you'd made it if you doubled that. But the challenge you'd have then is you'd still feel the same way, right? So a specific income goal isn't necessarily going to be on that list. But for me, I just, I didn't want to take a hit in what my family had kind of grown accustomed to. I didn't want to go backwards and have to make a bunch of sacrifices for the next five or six years to try to get there. So the business model that I painted in my mind included all those elements and perhaps a few more. I don't have the list in front of me, but I do remember writing it all down. So you've got that list. Now the challenge is let's go find a business. If you're willing to play this game with me, let's go find a business that meets those parameters. And unless you put on that list things like, I absolutely must work with clay. You know, I mold clay, I shape clay with my hands. I can't think or imagine of myself ever doing anything else to earn an income, right? If if you really narrow it down and say, okay, here's my specific thing that I really like doing. Here's my specific skill that I have that I believe God put me on this earth to do. Unless you did that, we can proceed. Now, if you did that, I would say, hey, how about if you carved out five, 10, 15 hours a week doing something that maybe you're not passionate about? something maybe you don't feel like God put you on this earth to do. But by carving out those 5, 10, 15 hours a week, you could begin to earn enough income to support whatever that thing is that you feel like you were made to do. Does that sound good? Because remember, one of the things we're looking for here is a business model that has complete flexibility of how much time you can put into it. Now, you can't just put an hour a month into it, obviously. It's going to require a little bit of time, just a few minutes minimum per day the model we're going to talk about. And the more hours per week you put into it, the faster you're going to see results, obviously. This isn't some kind of magic formula. This isn't some kind of, you know, push a few buttons and the money just shoots out of your computer. The people selling those programs are complete scams. This requires work. There is a learning curve here. But if you can carve some time out, you can then begin to see having the flexibility of schedule and the freedom of your time to do those things that you feel passionate about, that you feel like you want to do with your life. So how about we find a business that meets all those flexible criteria that we listed and talk about that? Before we do that, I want to to actually introduce another set of parameters because you may have heard me talk the way I have the first eight minutes or so of this program today. You may have heard me talk in the past about such things, but let me just introduce another element. What are the current trends in our culture that represent opportunities that are emerging and some of the new tools that very few people understand how to use properly that can give you almost an unfair advantage in pursuit of those opportunities. So not only are we talking about building the perfect business based on the parameters that we've written down, and you may have actually physically paused the episode and written them down. If you didn't, I'm gonna, if you've never done anything like that, why not? Take a shot at it. I encourage you. What would that perfect business look like? Well, now let's jump over. I'm going to fill in a few blanks on maybe another sheet of paper. What are the current trends in our culture that you should be paying attention to that are maybe opening up some opportunities for you? Those perfect business models where the competition is still relatively low, where very few people actually have the skill set to do it well. And it still meets all of those flexible requirements that we've written on that first page. Things like more and more people are shopping online than ever before. And some people are surprised to hear, and if you've listened to this podcast, you've heard me mention it many times, but most people are surprised to hear that only about 15% of all retail activity in the United States is online. The other 85% is still offline traditional retail. People get in their cars and go and drive and buy stuff. Most stuff, 85% of the time, 
The spending is done traditionally through retail channels, brick and mortar. Online is only 15%. Go back in time a few years, it was 5%. It's definitely trending up. The future forecasts based on government data, you can easily Google and get this information yourself. It's going to get to 20, then 25, then 30, then 35, 40%. That's the future trend. That's the next 10, 20 years. So we're trending in the direction of more people shopping online, fewer people shopping in retail. That's the direction we're trending. Trillions of dollars of spending online that's not happening in traditional retail stores. Well, how does that present an opportunity for you and I? If it's not obvious on platforms like Amazon, where most of the retail activity online in the United States is taking place, amazon.com. We have students all over the world, by, mind you. Just because I'm mentioning the US, Amazon, that's because that's the biggest place where you can jump in, regardless of where you live. We have a course called internationalaz.com. That's part of our Proven Amazon course. And a Proven Amazon course is our comprehensive collection of all our training modules. But International AZ is for those of you who live outside the United States who want to sell in the US. You start there and then you jump into the pack, the Proven Amazon course. But I don't want to get derailed on that right now. Just we do cover these topics in our training. So the United States... 15% of retail activity is online, 85% approximately is traditional. That trend is continuing in the favor of shopping online and the platforms that are available give the little guy, that's you and me, a huge advantage. If you learn how to spot underserved listings on Amazon, this is easily source inventory, but you can go buy most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you're paying full retail price and that's fine because the demand online is outpacing the supply online for that particular listing on Amazon. You learn to find those using the tools that are easily and readily available, the tools that we teach you how to use. You can build a very viable business fairly quickly. And that's what you've heard on hundreds of recent episodes of this podcast. Now, does it work for absolutely everybody? No, 100% not, because not everybody does the work. A lot of people don't even open the course. Some people try and misunderstand, they make mistakes, they buy products that they shouldn't have bought. I am a firm believer that if you follow the instructions in the course, you can avoid 99% of any issues you'll ever have. But some people jump out ahead, they use their instinct, they go scan a few barcodes and they think they can make some money, so they buy 50 units of a product they shouldn't have bought or they fall for a private label course or a scam somewhere along the line and they try to mix our training in with some training they've heard elsewhere. There's lots of things that can go wrong. And sometimes life just happens. You get sick, you don't pick up on the material, right? So I can't sit here and promise and guarantee anything. I won't do that. But I can say we've got a system that's working really, really well for a whole bunch of people right now. And you could be one of them. Follow the system. What's the risk? The risk is $29 a month for the Proven Amazon course. That's it. Jump in, start learning the program. So when I talk about the tools and the trends and the opportunities of our current culture that open up the doors for you to step into a business that looks like the one I described at the beginning of this episode, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Proven Amazon course. We teach you to use tools, tools that we didn't invent, Tools like Keepa, K-E-E-P-A, Keepa. We talk about it in podcast episode 369 of this podcast. Go back and listen to that show. I talk about why we love that tool, what it does that no other tool does. And there's a good handful of other tools, but you don't have to learn them all. You step into it slowly. We're offering right now, we've been doing it for the past several weeks with great success, Every new Proven Amazon course student who signs up at provenamazoncourse.com, they're offered the opportunity to go through a kickstart boot camp with a handful of other new students with one of our coaches kind of leading the group through the basics. And one of the things we'll, we'll be encouraging you to do very strongly is sell something, sell anything, get used to the process, sign up for an account, send in something. Uh, maybe it's a, a $40 nice 
coffee table book that you got a couple of years for Christmas that you never unwrapped or is still sitting there or something else. Just sell it. Sell it for a loss. That's fine. Get used to the process of sending something in, having a customer buy it, seeing that it works. And then we'll start moving you into some of the more advanced strategies of finding those underserved listings on Amazon that you can sell against. We call it the replens model. I'm not going to go into what that is, but the point of this episode today is a reminder of a couple things. One, it's this. If you're in a position where you're constantly trying to think of a business that meets your skill set, what am I passionate about? What was I made to do? You may be spending too much time there because we live in an era where if you can just carve out a few hours out of your week, you can begin to launch a pretty incredible business. And it slowly will become very interesting and you'll become very passionate about it as you see the results. I like to put it this way. If you've got a line of people standing there waiting to tell you thank you, you'll become very passionate about whatever it is that earned their gratitude. It doesn't matter what it is. If you've got a line of people eager to tell you thank you, you will become passionate about whatever it is that earned their gratitude. Do you catch that? Well, that's what selling on Amazon is. That's what selling online is. That's what selling anything to anybody is in a free market. You're not demanding that they pay you that money. They're paying you because they're grateful that you have a product that's worth less than what they're eager to pay for. And you're offering it to them. We know it's gratitude, those little certificates of appreciation, we call them around here, because they wouldn't give you the money if they weren't grateful. They would keep it. And they'd look for a better deal or, or spend their money elsewhere. But they're grateful that you have it at a convenient location, convenient time, delivered in a timely manner, and it's the product they're looking for. And they give you that green certificate of appreciation called money, and that's your evidence. So as people line up to say thank you, you're going to find yourself very passionate about whatever it is that you do. Don't let people talk you out of that. There will always be people who are very negative about people who earn a profit serving others well. One of my favorite examples, I can't remember where I heard this story, but it stuck with me. It's been several years ago. You might enjoy this story. And it's a true story, at least the way it was told to me at the time. I was, I was told it was true. It rings very true as I hear it for sure. But there was a lady who started a business. She was passionate about helping women who were fighting cancer, who'd gone through treatments and had lost their hair. Chemotherapy patients often lose some or most or all of their hair through the treatment process. You've seen this. So she became passionate about making wigs for these ladies. And at first it was kind of a volunteer thing. So she'd have ladies who had long hair, get haircuts, donate their hair. She'd make these high quality wigs. Well, it was an expensive process. So she began charging enough money to at least break even, but that was unsustainable. She's a busy lady with a busy life. She said, I've, I've got to make this a for-profit business if I want to continue to deliver an excellent product and help these women out. So she began charging what some people consider to be an exorbitant amount of money. But what you got to keep in mind is these ladies who had battled cancer and were in the fight of their life and they were coming through and celebrating and getting back their health and they were able to wear a wig that represented who they were going to become again at some point as they fought this fight they were willing to pay five or 10 times more than they'd paid for these beautiful pieces of art that this woman had created. I have real hair again. Their gratitude was um, incredible. The feedback, the letters and comments that she got, but she also got a whole bunch of people telling her, how dare you? How dare you take money from a cancer patient? How dare you make a profit providing something like that to somebody who's in that situation? And the people saying, how dare you? drove her into the ground emotionally, finished her off. She couldn't do it. So you know what the ladies who uh, are now losing their hair have as an option for wigs, if they want one, for fake hair? <laughs> Nothing. They don't get anything now. So are they better off or worse off? You tell me. I know where I stand on that story. So don't let the people who tell you, oh, you make money for doing that. It doesn't matter how you make a profit in business. It doesn't matter what your business model is. You will not have to look far to have people point at you and say, you get paid to do what? 
that doesn't make any sense to me. How dare you do that? What you have to get really good at is completely ignoring those people. If you want to engage them, just ask them what kinds of things they spend money on. <laughs> ask them how they feel about that. Are they grateful? Maybe they're just a person that doesn't have ever, ever have gratitude for anything. Yet I'm sure they spend their money on things that they want and that they'd like and that they need. And if they have any virtue inside of them at all, there's at least a little hint of gratitude. So why is their gratitude more virtuous than the gratitude of the ladies who are buying the wigs? Got me. That's a question for them, not me. Because when I spend my money, I'm always grateful. Otherwise, I wouldn't be spending the money. So hopefully that helps you process through the virtue of any business model. All business models are virtuous. If you're providing a product that launches a mutually beneficial relationship where even a week or two weeks or six months later, the person on both ends of that transaction are still grateful, still consider it to be money well spent. That's how you know you've built a great business model. And that's what it's like to sell online. You're creating convenience, you're saving people time, you're getting them the product they need. If they don't like the price, they wouldn't buy it. That's the free market. So that's why I call you a business building warrior. You've got people working against you on those types of messages and thought processes, but it's vital that you internalize these messages. There's virtue in selling products in a free market. Doesn't matter what the product is, as long as you're not hurting people, as long as you're not selling a poison or damage or you're misrepresenting the product somehow. But if people are freely choosing your product and giving you certificates of gratitude called money in exchange, you're doing a great work. So let's just take a look at the tools, trends, and opportunities that are out there for you to do just that. You will become very emotionally vested. You will become very fulfilled by the process of having a line of people waiting to pay you money for the products and services that you provide. And here's the good news. This is the cherry on top of today's episode, and I'll wrap it up here in just a minute. But as you begin to succeed in business, in any business, it doesn't matter what it is, you will have entered this almost elite club of people who have figured out how the world actually works and you can hang out with them and you see the world a little differently. You're someone who's learned how to delay gratification, for example, how to make sacrifices in the interest of others and then benefit in the long term. You're not a short-term thinker. You're a long-term thinker. You see the big picture. People like that make great friends. You'll be working with them. You'll be teaching them what you know. You'll be becoming friends with them. Maybe become a coach on our team, teaching other people these kinds of lessons. It's a beautiful community that you can begin to step in, not just our community here, the listeners to this show, the proven Amazon course students, but the people who run successful businesses. There's a camaraderie there. Those are great people to hang out with in your local community. Attend business owner meetings, Better Business Bureau, or whatever you have in your area. Get to know other business owners. They are some of the most amazing people. That will lead to more leadership opportunities and business opportunities and partnership opportunities. So if I'm encouraging you to do anything today, it's to make a little room in your headspace, if you've never done this before, for the possibility that building a successful business isn't about you finding what you're good at or finding what you're passionate about. It's about finding those gaps in the marketplace that are underserved and then setting about making sure that you're not burning yourself out pursuing whatever that gap is, that it meets the parameters that you've set in place for what you want out of life, how much time you want to spend with your family, where you want to work from, the flexibility, the freedom that you want. And yes, the income, that matters as well, of course. But you don't want something where you work in 80 hours a week and there's just not a whole lot to show for it. You want something that can be lucrative enough for your family to live the comfortable lifestyle that you know that you guys could have. And that's what I believe that I found with this model. That's what we've taught over the past 12 years to thousands of students. We've had, so over the past 18 years, we've had between seven and 10,000 coaching students, depending on how you count them. But that's a lot of people that we've coached. It's the oldest e-commerce coaching program in the world, to my knowledge. You could give us a call anytime. Go to silentgym.com. That's me, silent, J-I-M, silentgym.com. There's a phone number there. You can get on our schedule, book a slot. We'd love to chat with you about e-commerce, about building an Amazon business, or 
for $29 a month, you can get into the Proven Amazon course at provenamazoncourse.com. Hopefully you enjoyed this little thought journey today. If you filled out those two sheets of paper, I think uh, put some thought into it, take a look at it, see if you can find any holes or flaws in my logic. And again, to revisit those two pages one last time, on the first page, my dream business looks like this. Here's my routine. Here's when I get up each day. Here's how demanding it is of my time. Here's how flexible that my schedule is. You know, put those kind of dream scenarios together. There's no commute. I've got my business in my pocket. Those are some of the things that I put on mine. Put what you want on yours. And on the other side, am I paying attention to current trends in the world, the direction that e-commerce is heading, for example? That's a big one. I gave you some numbers and stats. I could give you a whole bunch more. But what do you know about the way the world's changing, where the world is heading? Where could you get an advantage in the marketplace? That's the thought process I took you through today. If you think you can do better, if you have a different take on it, I'd love to hear from you. Shoot me an email, jimcockrum at gmail.com. Let me know if I got off base today or something that you want to challenge me on, or if you just really enjoyed this episode and thinking through this with me, I'd love to hear from you either way. But no matter what your thoughts are, we'd certainly love to have some feedback. If you're listening on iTunes, we love having new subscribers. Click the little, it looks like a little bookmark on iTunes, some places, or it just says subscribe on a little button. Subscribe to this show. That helps us out. That helps us get the word out. And we'd love to get a review as well. Five stars, always appreciated, of course. It blows me away that we're coming up on globally around 900 or so uh, feedbacks on iTunes. And we're like 4.9 stars. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And I know it's not these episodes where it's just me talking <laughs> that carries the bulk of the load on this. It's when we have guests in-house, those inspirational guests. Uh, sometimes they're struggling. Sometimes they're succeeding wildly, but we love talking it through with all of them. And I know that's what makes this show special is it's student after student, real people who are doing this business. And we love bringing those shows to you. And we'll have another show like that very soon. Thanks for being a loyal listener to this show. Thanks for sharing it with your friends. Love seeing this show grow. Even though we have a $0 marketing budget, the numbers keep going up. About 100,000 listeners per month right now on iTunes. Isn't that amazing? We're so grateful for that. One of the new countries that popped up just last week on iTunes as being a top 10. This show was a top 10 in Greece. That's never happened before. That was pretty cool. So if you happen to live in Greece, this is a top 10 show on the entrepreneurial charts on iTunes. We're so proud of that. And in many other countries, many other friends all over the world, God bless you, business building warrior. We are here for you as a community, our leadership team, our coaching team, we want you to succeed. We want you to step into leadership. We've got a great platform for you to step on. If you've got some things you think you could bring to the party, hey, maybe it's just being on a podcast episode, sharing what you've learned along the way, or maybe you're going to be a coach on our team at some point. The prerequisite there is you've got to succeed doing the stuff that we teach and demonstrate that success over a significant period of time. And you've got to have a teacher's heart. If you've got those two things, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. But let's wrap this one up in under 30 minutes, like I promised, keeping it short. We will have another great episode for you again very soon. So thanks for joining me today. But before I let you go, I've got a treat for you. My good friend, Mr. Jeff Schick. We've had him on the show a few times lately, and he's been sharing some great insights for us today. I want to ask him, though, why should someone put an Amazon legal expert, a lawyer, on retainer as an Amazon seller? He's got a great service that does just that. So tell us about it, Jeff. So it's, it's a great question. Um, I guess first and foremost, you know, there obviously sellers can put any lawyer on retainer. When I was in law school, I had a lawyer on retainer. Um, they didn't happen to be an Amazon focused lawyer, uh, which, as I learned, was expensive because I was paying them to learn Amazon, and it wasn't uh, always the, the smartest financial decision. Um, but really, the whole benefit of having a lawyer on retainer is that you have someone as your point of contact. You have that team that you know to reach out to. So you've got me, you've got my paralegals. So when something goes wrong, you have someone that you can call for help and you're not immediately scrambling going, you know, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Because I remember when I got suspended the first time, I didn't even know suspensions were a thing on Amazon. So I immediately went to Google. I was copy, I copied and pasted the notice I received from Amazon because I was so confused by it. And and then on and then of course Google starts picking up all these different articles that have been written about suspensions and different people offering services. So 
you know, having that point of contact to know who to go to when anything goes wrong is, is crucial. But even more importantly, it's having that point of contact to go to when you have questions about things that you don't know so that things don't go wrong. Because the vast majority of my clients that I work with, you know, don't get suspended at all. In fact, you know, I had a seller ask me recently, they said, why aren't you posting reinstatement stories all the time about all these clients that you're reinstating? And I was like, well, you know, the reality is, is that of the clients who have had me on retainer for more than a month that we work with, um, I less than 1% of them this year have been suspended. Yeah, it just so, doesn't happen that often. And when it does it happen, doesn't... you get them back. Uh, <laughs> and you've been doing this for four years. And I, we've mentioned on other episodes, you know, like a 99% success rate getting folks back when they do run into some, some trouble. Right. Uh, it's an, a bit of an overblown issue, but it's something we definitely do need to focus on. Um, right. So, and it's and and I like to say the reason people don't like my that one percent rate isn't because Amazon's not suspending people. It's because they're calling with the questions. So, like for instance, I had a call today that with one of my clients, and they're like, "I'm thinking about buying from this this website." And I said, "Okay," and we go to it, and I go, it, just, "Something's off." I'm like, "I don't know what it is yet, just yet, but there's something off about it." And he goes, "Okay, well, what is it?" And I we start looking, and I'm like. Let's go to Google and see it. Like they have this picture of this warehouse. So let's go to Google and see if Google Maps lines up with that warehouse. Well, when we go to Google Maps and we pull up Street View, it's a different company name on the warehouse. It's not their, it's not even their warehouse. Okay, strike one. We start doing more research. And I'm like, they're just, it's not passing the smell test. There's something wrong with it. Um, well, on the one hand, you could sell, someone can say, well, you just stopped him from potentially ending a profitable product. On the other hand, I also stopped him from having a very costly suspension if the person was in fact selling, you know, counterfeit products. So it's calls like those that, you know, weren't the call wasn't even about that particular issue, but it just happened to morph into talking about that. And that could that can be the difference between him being suspended during Q4 and not being suspended because without that call and without that person to turn to, um, he would have you know, potentially bought that product and then ended up, you know, becoming one of those reinstatement stories you read about online. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so a lot of the value of, of getting you on retainer is preventing you being suspended to begin with because you're filtering some of the decisions you're making through someone who's, and you're a seller, you've been there, done that. Right. And you're familiar with our replens model around here, which is why you're such a friend of this community as uh, you've kind of connected those two dots better than anyone ever has before that line of communication from Amazon to our community from a legal perspective, just invaluable. So you, it's not a matter of just getting people reinstated. It's a matter of preventing them from ever being suspended to begin with. Right. And it's having, again, it's, it's yeah, I can't stress enough. It's having that team, you know, you've got your coaches on the one hand that you turn to with your Amazon questions. You've got your legal team on the others that you turn to with your legal questions. And together we're able to help just and you know, create that positive environment for sellers to succeed and that, and really thrive. And so, it's that's really what it's all about. It's it's people not having to turn to social media when making important business decisions that have long term impacts to themselves, their family, and what they're doing. Yeah, so. using a using a real pro. And I, I appreciate the the very low monthly fee to the services that you provide and having folks on retainer. We've got you on retainer. Many of others in our community, our leaders do as well can't encourage it enough as your biz business begins to grow and you start asking yourself as you're falling asleep at night, hey, how secure is my Amazon account? I, I'm making some money here. I want to protect this thing. This is like buying an insurance policy, having a guy who knows his stuff. So I appreciate you having, being around, Jeff, and, and doing these segments with us, man. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. We'll appreciate do another it. one again real soon. Is that all right? Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds great, buddy. We'll talk to you then. Awesome.